Okay, guys, so today we're going to be talking about colic, and we're going to divide this into, I'm thinking three, two for sure, but maybe three uh, different PowerPoints, and they're all going to be in the colic PowerPoint that I posted in the PowerPoint uh, files. But what happens is we're going to first talk about gastric ulcers, then we're going to talk about uh, medically treated colic, and then we're going to talk about surgically treated colic, okay? They're all part of the same subject, colic, even though gastric ulcer is its own subject, but they're all together in uh, the PowerPoint that's called colic, okay? Let's, oh, shoot. Hold on, come back. Let's share this guy here. Okay. Where is it better to be? There. So we're going to talk about, like I said, colic and uh, a little bit of an overview of a lot of things. Okay. So starting out, so as you guys know, the uh, GI tract starts in the mouth, goes to the esophagus, stomach, intestines, and gets out in the rectum and anus. Okay. Um, there is, so we're going to talk about different sections, segments of the GI tract. And to start with the stomach, there is a few things that may happen in the stomach. One of, a very common one is gastric ulcers, okay? I want to send to you, um, but it's, it may be too much for you guys to read. Um, okay, let, let me see if I can uh, cover this the way that I would cover in class. So, the gastric ulcer. So gastric obviously means stomach. So we need to remember the stomach anatomy, okay, as we can see here in this picture. If you guys remember, we have this area that is aglandular. Is it called, is it say there? So aglandular. And this area here, that's called glandular, okay? This line that divides is called the, uh, the Margus plicatus, okay? The Margus plicatus. We need to understand that the A glandular has its name because it has no glands, okay? So what kind of glands? There is no glands there. And the glandular part has glands, the glands that uh, secrete gastric juices, okay, the acids, and the glands that also secrete mucus. Okay, so they have, uh, so the gastric juices are secreted here to help in digestion, but because gastric juices are acidic, this part here also uh, secretes mucus, so it covers, it lines up this area, so the gastric juices are not uh, in contact with the lining as to not create ulceration. The problem, so this part here is covered in mucus, okay? and protected from the gastric juices. This part here is not. So a lot of, the great majority of the gastric ulcers are going to occur in this, the aglandular part. The great majority of them actually in this lining, okay, in the area where um, the aglandular is going to join with the glandular. How do I delete this i guess i don't know um so there is multiple reasons why okay but mainly because there's no mucus that is going to uh, cover this area so we have the esophagus is going to line up here okay and then the duodenum so these of the food comes from the mouth to the esophagus lines up here gets digested a little bit broken down a little bit here and leaves from the duodenum all the way over there. So as you guys can imagine, if you have to diagnose gastric ulcers, you need to have um, an endoscope and you have to scope the horse. And as you enter with your endoscope here, it's easy to see ulceration in this area, okay? It is, you have to have a much longer endoscope to be able to see the glandular area of ulcerations, which sometimes in this pyloric area, you're gonna have ulcers also. Uh, most horses are here, 
For some reason, warm bloods tend to have ulcers in this area here, which is actually more difficult to treat, more difficult to diagnose as well, okay? What else did I wanna say? So what takes a horse, uh, what makes a horse uh, have gastric ulceration there? There is a few things. So number one, if you guys remember, horses are supposed to eat how many hours a day? 16 to 18 hours a day. They're roaming around, they're grazing all the time. And if you guys remember, I said that gastric juices are produced what? All the time, okay? Although at night, because horses sleep at night and at times of inactivity, there is less gastric juices being produced, but in uh, essence, it's produced all the time, number one. Number two, what is the role of the saliva? If you guys remember, I said the saliva in horses is not so much to digest starch like it is for us and dogs, for example, but it is mainly to, uh, to wet, to moisten the food so it can easily go to the esophagus without creating a choke, okay? And also the horses only produce saliva when? When they are actually masticating, okay? They don't produce saliva if they're just in their stall, not doing anything. It, it, you guys can see that their mouth is going to become dry. So that combination with um, gastric juices, but the saliva that would come and also buffer because the pH of the saliva is higher than the acidic environment of the, uh, of the stomach, the saliva also helps to buffer the stomach, okay? So to make the pH a little bit more towards neutral. Um, so as you guys can see, so you're producing a lot of um, gastric juices, which is acidic. You're not in, a, in an empty stomach, for example, if the horse is just standing around and not uh, outside grazing. And um, not saliva to buffer, and the stomach is totally empty. So this stomach here is 100% empty because the horse hasn't received a meal in six, seven hours, okay? Such as what we do to horses that are stable. So, and that's why I say here that what, are, what is the ideology of ulcerations? So management practices is a lot. So when horses start to not have food for multiple hours, the feeding frequency will lead to gastric ulcerations, depending on how bad it is that you leave these horses without food, okay? So that's why I say the horses that uh, are going to be stabled, if they're gonna be inside their stalls, they need to have a slow feeding hay net because for horses, here's the thing, horses may finish like their two flakes or three flakes of hay within one hour, okay? If they are voracious eaters. And if you, that's why we have slow feeding hay nets to try to slow it down. And horses that actually are very efficient in eating, they will eat in the slow feeding hay nets more or less like in two hours as opposed to one hour. So it's not like it stops them uh, from eating and it's not like they eat super, super slow, okay? But it prolongs, so they have, they masticate for longer and they have more food inside their stomachs for longer, okay? Uh, obviously, it's the more stress the horses have, uh, the more chances for ulcerations. There is research that shows that horses that are more stressed, such as high-strung Arabians, for example, thoroughbreds, they have higher chances of gastric ulcer. So horses that are high-strung, the ones that are chill and are okay inside their stall and don't, you know, they're just like happy with life, have less chances, less prevalence of gastric ulcers. For example, um, Quarter horses. Quarter horses in training also stay in their stalls all the time. They also get fed meals, especially, be, and they get fed even less hay because um, they get fed more easily. But for example, a reigning horse, uh, a Western pleasure horse, they are uh, under the same demands as another type of training horse, such as a warm blood or a thoroughbred. Uh, in the sense that they are in their stall 23 hours a day and the one hour that they're not, they are not being ridden, okay? But the prevalence in gastric ulcers in these kinds of quarter horses, it's about 40%, okay? And the prevalence in gastric ulcers in uh, Arabians during the endurance uh, season is about 90 to 95%, okay? In the off season, so when they go to take a break, 
the these Arabians, the prevalence of gastric ulcer drops to about 60 to 65 percent. So when they're under less stress and less traveling, okay, they can actually self-heal because the stomach, if left alone for a little bit longer with a horse turned outside eating grass all the time, they can actually heal themselves, okay? In thoroughbreds, in racing, research has shown that the prevalence of gastric ulceration in thoroughbreds in racing as they are being trained and kept in stalls is about 85 to 95% of gastric ulcers. There is another research showing that broodmares, and that was not a wonderful, the most wonderful research, but broodmares, and they can be like the ones that raced before, and then they are now retired to become broodmares, about 60 to 65% of them have gastric ulcers, which means that what? That about 30% of them got healed after they had a change in career, okay? So they went from being a racehorse to becoming a broodmare. So I think it's important for all of us to understand that being a stress, being high strung, transportation, there is a, a research that shows that you put a horse in a trailer and you travel with them for six hours, you get to the destination, they have developed gastric ulcers. So transporting a horse, hauling a horse is enough of a stress for them and it causes ulcers, okay? Uh, social order, so that causes stress. When a horse is being picked on, all the time, he never gets a chance to eat well, he never gets a chance to, to slow down and be calm and quiet. There's always somebody picking on him because of his pecking order that causes stress. So that's why I say the management is important because it is the job of a horse farm, uh, of the manager or the owner of the farm to actually figure out how to best put these horses to lower their stress level. So a quiet, well-managed farm is very, very important for these horses. Um, what else did I wanna say? There is uh, another research, so we're talking about horses in training independently of the breed. There is another research that shows that, uh, like those Grand Prix jumpers, so horses that jump and compete in Olympic kind of uh, events, they actually have less ulceration, gastric ulcer, than horses that are like in the three, the one meter kind of level. So horses that, that jump like five, four, five, seven, uh, they have less ulcers than the horses that jump the three foot, four foot uh, type of fences. And nobody knows exactly why, but one of the reasons that has been the theory is that they all start to develop, they are all stressed, they're all going training, and the ones that were able to withstand training without becoming ulcerated, they were actually to go up the level. So it may not even be that, that the three footers have less uh, ability or less, they're not as talented as the, six, the five footers. The thing is like, it prevented them from actually performing well because they became, because of their stress, because of their uh, demeanor, it became more difficult for them because they actually have developed gastric ulcers, okay? So it's just something for us to be thinking about. And we all know, uh, as horses, when you, and here's the thing, some horses like to work, some horses, so it's important that when we, for example, adopt a thoroughbred, which is something that a lot of people do, um, it's important to understand, depending on how long they've been off race, um, they may or may not have gastric ulcers. And some of them, you can just assume that they have gastric ulcers. And does it bother them? It may not even bother them. Some of them, they have it and they just go on with their lives. And some of them are less stoic with their pain and having ulcers will prevent them, will make them cranky, rearing, bucking, cannot uh, exercise, etc. So some of the things that I think is important for us to understand is as we adopt these thoroughbreds, uh, some of them, we just say, we want them to be a horse. And, uh, and then this is the six-year-old horse that just stopped racing and he hasn't been turned out, okay, in a big field since he was a yearling. And we say, let's just turn him out so he can learn to be a horse because that's what he needs. And that particular practice in that in some horses 
will stress them out because they don't know what to do with that much space. And instead of eating the grass and being doing well and uh, just relaxing, they actually get more agitated and more stressed because they are very safe in a stall. They feel safe, they like that, and they may become even stressed. It's the same. I always like to, to say it's the same people like, what, which one is best? You live in an apartment or to live in the fields, in the country? It depends. If you grew up in Montana, in big fields uh, where everything is beautiful and gorgeous, and then you take, uh, you go to New York City where, there, where everything is packed and small, and you feel, you're going to feel claustrophobic. Now, take somebody that grew up, was born, grew up in New York City, has always lived in uh, small apartments and confinement. You take them to Montana and say, and here is the world, and here is this beauty. They're going to feel lost. They're going to say, oh my gosh, I need the noise, I need the sounds, I need more packing. It's too vast over here. So it's just something to, uh, to think about. I used to board a horse that was a saddlebred. And if, and if, if you guys know anything about saddlebreds, they have, uh, like they have some pads in their shoes. Uh, they don't get sword, but they get pads on their shoes to make them uh, lift their legs a little bit higher. And because of those pads, they cannot be turned out, okay, when they are in training. So these horses live because they may be in training for, you know, until they're 15, 20 years old and they live in stalls. And sometimes, so when they retire, they kind of don't like to go outside, okay? Because that's their life. That's what they're used to do. And I used to board for this particular horse and I used to ask, because this is like, you learn as you go too. Uh, and I used to tell Dion, let's just turn him out. He's gonna love it, blah, blah, blah. And I'll tell you what, I turned that horse out in a very small field, just like a little lot, very small. And he stood by the gate without moving because that thing was so used to just standing in a stall all day long that when I turned him outside, instead of like going to uh, explore the area, all he wanted to do is to stay by the gate waiting to be brought in because that was his comfort, okay? So this is all uh, important for you guys to comprehend. Now, management practices when it comes to uh, gastric ulcers uh, there is a lot of things. So if the horse has gastric ulcers and they have been scoped, and we're going to talk about diagnosis here in a second, they need to be treated, okay? There is one FDA-approved treatment, and that is uh, GastroGuard or UlcerGuard. They're the exact same medication. And so GastroGuard is supposed to be used by for 28 days, and uh, and they, if it's the, the ulcer, the 80% of the ulcers, which is the in the... Uh, squamous part of the stomach, squamous part of the stomach, uh, which is the non-glandular part, okay? If you treat with GastroGuard, uh, they are going most likely get healed, okay? Plus management changes. Uh, the other 20% uh, of ulcers, they may take a little longer to get healed, the ones in the pyloric area. So that's a given. But then how do you do? It's not just... Uh, using GastroGuard for these horses, but you also need to change the management. So having hay in front of this horse, these horses are gonna be living in a stall. They have to have hay in front of their noses all day long, okay? They need to be put in a place that they actually like their neighbors if they're gonna be in stall. So if the, uh, if you, if you, here's a stall, okay? Stall, 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 stall. You put a horse here, and you put his feed here. Say you throw, this is the door, okay? You throw hay here. But he hates, this is the horse, his neighbor. And every time he tries to eat his hay here, this neighbor comes and kicks, kicks, kicks. This horse, it doesn't matter. He is not going to finish his hay. He's going to be timid and is not going to like to eat over here. So if this is the case, you can either move him to this stall if it gets along well with this horse and also this horse, or you need to move his hay, this area. But here's the thing, and I don't know why this thing does this, okay? Let me see if I can, oh, this is how you delete this. I learned how to delete, you use this other area. Uh, so this is the thing, you either have hay here, but no, come on, but no one likes to have a neighbor that 
threatens this horse all the time. So it's important to change the management of this horse. So hay in front of this horse at all times. Number two, if you're gonna continue to show this horse, before you take your travel to show, you need to um, give the maintenance dose of ulcer guard, which is going to be a quarter of the tube before, so two, three days before uh, you take him to the show, during the show, during the transportation, then two, three days after you come back from the show, okay? So that's important too. The other thing that's important for horses that stay in their stall, if, they're, if they receive their feed, their hay at six in the morning, you arrive to ride at 2 p.m. I'll tell you what, these horses have, have had an empty stomach for a long time, okay? So before you actually put him, because now you see the stomach is empty and now full of gastric juices, and as you start to trot and canter, the slushing of this uh, juices around is just gonna splash this uh, acid all over the wall of the stomach and that can cause ulceration. So another thing that you can do is give a flake of fay for this horse before you actually take him to exercise. So those are all management practices that need to be done so you can maintain your horse ulcer free, okay? Uh, foals, foals when they get sick, they get a fever, oh my gosh, these things like to develop ulcers. So they can colic, they can develop ulcers and it's important uh, that we understand that. The other thing that can cause ulcers in horses is non-steroidal and also steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So butbenamine, it has been shown that butbenamine is going to cause gastric ulcers. And the reason for that is because if you guys remember the inflammatory cascade, they're going to block the production of prostaglandins, okay? And there is one time of prostaglandin that actually is responsible for mucus production. So when you block all these prostaglandins, guess, guess what? The mucus production in the stomach is going to be cut off and the gastric juices will continue to be produced. So now you have gastric juices, but you do not have the protective mucus, okay? So you are going to develop, to increase the risk of developing gastric ulcers, okay? Clinical signs, weight loss, dull hair coat, poor performance, a horse that has bad behavior, he's rearing, he's cranky, but a horse that was healthy before and then develops ulcer, you can actually see because they, uh, their behavior just changes. They look dull, they look listless, okay? Poor appetite. So a horse that used to eat uh, his feed within 10, 15 minutes, now just leaves it there because he knows every time. So this goes, again, another management practice, give hay before you give feed. Why? Because if you have a stomach that's empty and then droplets of feed come and fall from the esophagus into the stomach, it just splashes juices everywhere. Now, if you eat hay, it creates that a buffer, like a cushion for this because hay comes in and it's like a big chunk comes in and doesn't fall tick, tick, tick inside the stomach. So it's another thing, another management practice is to do that. But when I say here, poor appetite is the horse that uh, is not caring much for his hay, is not caring much for his grain, it's not doing that, you know, dough hair coat, poor performance. It just like, we, you tighten the girth and he has pain uh, when you go around the, those juices as they touch the ulcerations, they just make it more painful, okay? Uh, mild recurring colic is also a clinical sign of gastric ulcers. This horse that is not doing well, it is not going to have a fever. So how do we diagnose? We The only way to actually diagnose gastric ulcer, I put here physical exam to make sure that the horse doesn't have another disease. And we're just saying, oh, he has gastric ulcers because it's important to make sure. Blood work, everything comes back normal. The only way, there's two ways really, but the most the best way to do it is to do endoscopy, okay? Uh, so you have to fast this horse for 12 hours, 10 hours, um, and then pass the endoscope to see if you can find ulcers. Uh, the other endoscopy is going to cost about 200, okay? Um, the other way to do two is response to treatment. So you start giving this horse gastroguard and see if in two weeks he is responding better. 
And that's another way to diagnose. Yes, he responded so well to gastroguard that it's probably ulcers too. Now, gastroguard is about 35, I don't know, to $42 a day. I'm assuming more towards this uh, for 28 days. Let me calculate. It's a thousand dollars, okay? Uh, 42 times 28, it's seven a thousand one hundred and seventy six dollars okay so if you um want to start with treatment and see if the horse gets better within a week or two we're talking about 42 times 14 we're talking about 588 dollars to figure out if the horse is going to get better or not and the endoscopy is going to be 200 so it's just something to think about okay because if this you're going to be spending $600 to see if he responds well to treatment and then you have to continue treating and this one if you do endoscopy and you see that the horse does have ulcers you're going to be spending about $1,400 okay so it's something to it's not a cheap disease to have okay um we already talked about um uh, the different um areas of the stomach uh, the severity of the ulcers are graded uh, between zero to, hold on, they have read me. Uh, they change this grading, okay? It goes now from zero to four. And it is zero, it's totally normal. Four, one starts with uh, gastritis, so the reddening, the reddening and uh, of the area can be now a grade one as well as small single ulcer grade two you can see the ulceration here small ulcer grade three is bigger ulcer and then grade four is going to be what we're looking right here like all the area is ulcerated okay treatment what's the treatment for uh, gastric ulcers uh, the best treatment and the one that is uh, FDA approved of the omeprazole is gastroguard. So the best treatment, the one that we have best result is omeprazole. It's given once a day and is the only FDA approved is gastroguard, okay? There is in other countries, omeprazole in other forms, there is one that's given IV and it's once a week and it's cheaper. Uh, I think they have that in Australia and in Europe, uh, but it's not, it hasn't arrived here in the United States yet, okay? Oh, there is other um, omeprazoles in the market, like sprinkles and things like that, that you add to food. And the truth is they're not FDA approved and they're actually illegal, okay, to be sold. Uh, because um, it, for the veterinarian, they need to prescribe what the FDA approves. Um, and compounding pharmacies may carry other types of omeprazole, but veterinarians, by law, are not allowed to prescribe um, medications, uh, compounder medication when you have a brand medication, okay? Uh, ranitidine is the same as Zentac. Uh, it needs to be given two to three times a day, so it's more uh, cumbersome, but it also, this is, it, they work a little different. This uh, prevents the hydrogen to be pumped to form the uh, HCL in the stomach and ranitidine is just buffering the stomach. Cimetidine is very similar to ranitidine. Uh, it needs to be given three times a day. And then we have nalox. Nalox is a wonderful thing you can add to the feed, but to treat, so, to not, so when you feed the horse, that doesn't bring a lot of acidity, so it buffers. But if you want to treat ulcers with nalox, you need to give every two hours. And that's extremely expensive, the most expensive thing that there is. Um, other types of medications, so a lot of horses respond well also to uh, sucralfate. Uh, you need to give at least twice a day. And uh, do all the um, pyloric ulcers and ulcerations that we may think happens in the lower sides of the intestinal tract, like colonic ulcers. Uh, will respond well to sucralfate. It's expensive, okay? Already talked about this. Uh, diet, We're more hay, more hay, hay in front of this horse all the time, slow feeding hay net. The other thing too 
is that alfalfa has a high percent of calcium and alfalfa has been shown to also because calcium as you guys know like some um, things that we eat for when our stomach is a little sour has calcium has magnesium so those particular um <laughs> though my dog those particular um products will help buffer the stomach as well okay so uh the other thing that you can do instead of giving the horse uh, a flake of hay you can give a flake of hay and also give 10 tums um for him to eat before you exercise him. But alfalfa has a lot of calcium, so that has shown to also help the horse, okay? So this is what I had for gastric ulcers. And I'm gonna make another video so we can talk about colic, okay? I'll see you in a little bit.